I'm Dakota Jackson, not Dakota Johnson. I am based in New York, but you can find me in better homes all over Los Angeles. And you are listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Nowhere in the world celebrates modernism better than Modernism Week in Palm Springs, California. Every February, they have a week-long architecture and design festival, which actually lasts 11 days, and U.S. Modernist Radio is there, interviewing nearly all of Modernism Week's keynote speakers plus special guests. It all happens at the U.S. Modernist Compound, a.k.a. Poolside, at the Hip Hotel Skylark. If you are in the mid-century modern, Modernism Week is a joyous festival of mid-century architecture, insightful lectures, plentiful martinis, shopping, nonprofit benefit events, architecture documentary premieres, eye-popping house parties, brilliantly curated house tours, detailed art and architecture exhibits, and so much more. I'm Tom Guild. There's nothing like the critical mass of clever and creative people who head the Modernism Week in Palm Springs. George and I get a literal poolside seat and chat with designers, filmmakers, authors, and other people who defy categorization. It's an amazing week, and heading up the U.S. Modernist delegation, it's the master of martinis, the ambassador of appetizers, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Thank you, Tom. I call it the Modernism Week Diet, and it basically consists of having breakfast in the morning, skipping lunch all day, and then starting about 5 o'clock, having martinis and appetizers for the evening. (laughs) This may not sound nutritious because it's not, (laughs) but every year... Doing this for 11 days, I end up losing like six or seven pounds. So it's really great to come back having experienced a modernism week diet. You must be doing something right. (laughs) If you're into mid-century modernism, modernism week is the Super Bowl, the Woodstock, the Olympics of all the architecture that we love. I really can't say enough about the staff and volunteers of modernism week that put on hundreds of events every year of all kinds. It takes a village, a a huge village of people in the community, in the different towns around Palm Springs, the business community, the government of Palm Springs. Everybody's pulling together to make this happen, and it's an extraordinary experience. Do you want to go with me and Tom to Modernism Week in 2023 and stay at the U.S. Modernist Compound? Email me at george at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family. Restoring Significant Architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. And by modernist realtor Angela Roll. In a story that we are largely making up, modernist realtor Angela Roll worked her way through college, dancing like no one's watching to Mambo No. 5 and brilliantly house-flipping Neutra, sometimes simultaneously. At 22, following a celebrity-filled party at a famous hillside L.A. modernist house, Involving diving off the roof into the pool, absolute limon, and a new use for WD-40, Angela was recruited to the architecture school, where after years of sleep-deprived design studios, she's now a modernist real estate agent with specialized training, advising buyers and sellers on everything from appropriate renovation to saving a completely doomed mid-century house from destruction. That last one is true. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L or 919-995-0550. We're kicking off this year's Modernism Week shows with two well-known names in architecture and design, Jeannie Gang and Jicky Torres, and later Palm Springs jazz singer Rose Millette. Architect Jeannie Gang studied architecture at the University of Illinois, Harvard, the ETH Swiss Federal University of Technical Studies in Zurich, and the École Nationale in Versailles, France. After working with OMA Rencoulhaus in Rotterdam, starting point for another fine architect we know and love, 
She returned to the U.S. and founded Studio Gang in Chicago. With additional offices in New York, San Francisco, and Paris, it's one of the most prominent award-winning design firms in the world. In Chicago, she designed the Aqua Tower, among other projects, and she's working on a major expansion at O'Hare International Airport. Jeannie Gang is a MacArthur Genius Grant winner. She teaches at Harvard, lectures all over the world, and she's written two books, Reveal and Reverse Effect, Renewing Chicago's Waterways. Here's George's conversation with Jeannie Gang. Groucho Marx famously said, I don't want to belong to any club that will accept me as a member. Jeannie Gang famously said, this idea of obsolescence is outdated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so tell me about that. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's a, you know, there was a time in the last century, there was an embrace of obsolescence, which was really about architects lightening up and, you know, you get buildings like, um, well, walking cities and temporary architecture. And there was just an, an excitement around this kind of temporality. But that also was coupled with a lot of consumption. And there were, at the time, after World War II, companies were trying to get people to buy more, eat more, save more. That's why we have built-in cabinets in buildings, is it, it suddenly became necessary to build more storage into buildings to put all the stuff. So it became about planned obsolescence. And as we move into understanding the environment more and more, it's more important to think about reducing that consumption and to, you know, we, we no longer want our buildings to be thrown away. We want to make them last. And that's really the most sustainable thing you can do is use them longer, reuse other buildings, renew older buildings. And so it really reduces the carbon footprint. So that's why obsolescence is obsolete. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, as an architect, how do you assess whether something is fixable or repairable or, or it has to be torn down? How do you make that call? Well, a lot of times it's not our call to make. So, you know, what our role is oftentimes is trying to help owners assess what can be done, how can the building be, if they need more area, how can it be increased, if they, if they want to make it last, you know, what can be done. So right now my research at Harvard has been on trying to get people to think about concrete architecture, the brutalist era, because those are really approaching the 50-year mark, and they're starting. we're starting to lose them. Um, yes. And there's such a big quantity of them that that will be a significant loss of building fabric. And building fabric means, you know, carbon that we could have saved from going into the atmosphere. So how can we renew these, reinvent them? They're not all great buildings. Like, you know, some are quite anonymous, but, you know, they're still a lot of energy ex expanded into the materials that went into them and to their construction. So if we can reuse them, that's the best. Architecture for a long time is kind of bragged on itself as far as designing buildings that are energy efficient. Mm -hmm. But it seems like the attention now is, is going to the actual materials going into the building in the first place. Yeah, yeah, we call it embodied carbon because, see, I think we did a good job at reducing energy use and high performance buildings. But because the climate emergency is so urgent, <laughs> it is an emergency, it, it's really necessary to just stop emitting carbon now, which is the whole chain of where the materials come from, the mining, the whatever you have to do, and then the emissions that come from the concrete curing, for example, or melting down materials like aluminum, all of those emissions are what we really need to curb quickly. So, yeah, so reuse is a great strategy. And while we do that, I know there's a lot of really interesting advances coming down the pike for very low emission concrete, which I'm excited about, like up to 98% of redu reduction in emissions if we switch from Portland cement to other materials that will help the concrete cure. Is concrete the biggest culprit in most buildings? It, it is because, you know, it's a great material, so it's very popular to use. And people all over the world can make concrete buildings. So it's, it's not just a, a first world, you know, rich person's material. It's a material that, that you can make anywhere because it essentially comes out of limestone, which is just layers of earth. And you bake that and you get, it's like making cookies. You make it, um, right. um, it you have to have that material that will make the fluid concrete adhere to the aggregate. And that's where, you know, that's the substitute we need is really for the Portland cement. Okay, that's cool. 
Now, how do they improve the this concrete? This is such a technical conversation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think people want to know because, yeah. you know, we hear climate crisis and the average it, person doesn't really know where that right. comes from in relation right. to our buildings. Well, you know, concrete, it's just an industry that it, it's a little bit like the fossil fuel industry. It's like the incumbent and it's, they need to have pressure to change it. We Really, we need legislation that will force us to reduce the emissions and that will force the innovation to happen. Well, that's really cool. I'm looking forward to seeing concrete that's better. Yeah, yeah. It's a great material in general. So easy to work with, so strong, and um, I really want to save it <laughs> if we can. <laughs> if we can, yeah. At least while we're living, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Now, a number of years ago, you won a MacArthur grant, mm. a.k.a. the Genius Grant. So I want to ask you a question. I don't think you've been asked before about this. <laughs> When MacArthur Fellows go out drinking, what do they talk about together? Uh, oh, well, that's <laughs> interesting. There's only been a few experiences of doing that because it's not a thing where uh, there's often get-togethers. Okay. Uh -huh, but there have I, been a few. And, I figured the alumni yeah. would, you know, come yeah. in. and Once in a while they yeah. have something. And and it, it's really, yeah, it just it blows your mind because the things people are working on in such different fields that, it you know, it's just a kind of wonderful experience. So, yeah, talk about everything, I guess, <laughs> everything under the sun. Do you find that you've been influenced by that experience in your work from these other professions and passions that fellows have had? Yeah, just in, in general, I love working with people in different fields for, you know, whatever's relevant for a project, we usually seek out someone who has expertise in that area and and you just end up learning it's a little bit like being a journalist you know you need to do your homework and then you find the right team so it might be focused on a project that that wouldn't otherwise have that expert so of course every day we work with engineers and landscape architects and people like that that are slightly different than us but kind of the same family but I really I do like working with people that are in totally different fields because I would think you might have like a mathematician, a poet, a civil rights leader, a uh, yeah. ceramicist. I mean, there are just so many people y yes, in the MacArthur are. family. And astrophysicists, uh, if you really want to have your mind blown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and people in science that are making incredible new discoveries and, and artists that are bringing new observations to problems that exist. Uh, yeah, it's very, very exciting. Now, a lot of people don't know that in addition to these wonderful and huge projects mm -hmm. that you're involved in all over the planet. You did a couple of houses. Um, <laughs> one of them was the Brick Weave House in Chicago. Tell us mm -hmm. about that house. Yeah, that's a house that um, I, I guess I, I love doing houses. And before starting my own practice, I was a, the designer with Rome Kohlhaas on a very famous house, the house in Bordeaux. With the elevator. Oh, so, yes. So, yeah. and so, with, the, with the platform yes. that goes up and down. I saw the documentary uh, yes. <laughs> of that lady with the vacuum trying to clean it. That yes. was hilarious. Uh, yes. It's a wonderful house. And um, after that, I worked with Larry Booth in Chicago on a number of houses as well. So, and so I have a love for it. But with my practice, it does take a lot of personal attention because it's, it's a personal thing yeah. to do someone's house. So, um, we just do it very exclusively with people that we like or yeah. have very interesting ambitions. And so with the Brick Weave House, it was uh, uh, friends that were in the ad agency in Chicago and they just were so nice and we really hit it off. And so it was an existing building that had gone through a fire. So it really wasn't a brand new house. It was a renovation of a house that they discovered it had been burned <laughs> after they bought it. And so the Brick Weave House was really about repairing caring and repairing for this existing house and transforming it into something contemporary, modern, and fun. And so internally, it's a continuous climb. Spatially, you can see all the levels connected from the living room. And then there's little different out exterior spaces. It's on a very tight site in a, in a neighborhood. Um, and so we created a, a courtyard on the front of the house off of the dining that has a, a brick weave. I'd always wanted to do this kind of light diaphanous brick wall and um, it turned out to be a huge technical challenge too but but we did it and it's it's really great is it a technical challenge because of the material or finding somebody talented enough to put it together well it it was a technical challenge because the structural engineer didn't agree with the 
Masons about what the mortar needs to do. Because, you know, Masons... That sounds like a a Lewis Kahn poem. What does the mortar need to do? (laughs) Yes, the mortar. (laughs) Yeah, the Masons would like the mortar to be more flexible. And Mm -hmm. and the structural engineers are always wanting it to be stiffer. And so the solution, and as an architect, you know, you don't always have the technical solution, but you kind of know who to get in the same room. Yeah. We approached the company that makes brick ties. So they they have engineers in-house. So they, they make the little invisible steel ties that connect walls to back up walls and things like that. Um, They make inside the mortar. Yeah. Basically. Like, um, you know, every four or five rows, you'll have a, a truss. It's a, it's called a truss, but it's a very small horizontal wire. Yeah. uh, Just holds it in place. Yes. Yeah. Um, And so they were able to provide the engineering that we needed, you know, to, to satisfy both the structural engineer and the, and the Mason's, so it was like I said, it's, you know, it's it's a matter of getting the right people on the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And your firm, I mean, it seems to have the knack for doing that because in your projects, you are taking on very complex problems yeah. like you're going to be working on O'Hare. Yeah. You know, it's just like this thing where there's always people that say you can't do this. And that's something that gets me really excited because then I, when I hear you can't do this, then I, I want to just go through and methodically you know, solve that kind of problem. Jeannie, you can't design my house. You just can't. You can't do it. (laughs) Why not? I know, I know, I know. But it's true. It's like there are people that say you can't, and I'm someone who gets excited by hearing that. That's true. Now, which which part of O'Hare are you doing? Which are the terminals over there? Um, It's Terminal 2, but it, it will be a replacement, you know, of course, saving what we can from Terminal 2 below grade. And it will, it's going to be transformed into an international. Is that the term. United Gates, basically? It, well, it's it's really interesting because I think it's the first time ever where two airlines, Air American and United, are going to come together and share the um, terminal. The facility. Yeah. Okay. So it's really, it's kind of a nice story of collaboration on their part. And does that also include any kind of transit thing or a, a, a shuttle to get people more around the airport? Because... Right now, I know that it's a little awkward to get between some of the terminals. Yeah, it will eventually, like United, which has an underground connection, this will have an underground connection to some remote concourses, and it'll have, you know, both walking and eventually also like a train to get you between those. Okay, okay. But you'll be able to, this is the exciting part, come in to O'Hare internationally and then just transfer to a domestic flight without having to change terminals. Without leaving security, the secured yep. area? Uh, well, I think they still make you, oh, there's a hummingbird right behind you. How cute. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I love birds. Um, instead of having to change over to the international terminal or from the international terminal to domestic, you'll be able to go through customs right there and then okay. change. Yeah, and then I think you will you will either recheck or go to the go other. Go through yeah, a tunnel yeah. and... Yeah. You know, access yeah. it that way, mm-hmm. like a lot of international right. gateways do. Yeah. But being so compact, I think it'll really make Chicago the hub, again, the central hub, because it's it'll be so convenient. I recently watched a, a National Geographic special mm-hmm. on the reconstruction of LaGuardia in New York. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I assume you've been over there at some point during at, all that project. Uh, during and before and after, yes. And it's a complete transformation for sure. So will there be the same kind of dynamic at O'Hare that you're going to have to be taking it apart as you build it and keep all the planes flying at the same time? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, a big challenge, a logistical challenge. That just seems and, amazing. That's yeah. so many chess moves yeah. you've got to do. Mm-hmm. We're, we're also working on the United States Embassy in Brazil, in Brasilia, mm-hmm. and that's another one where we're going to be building the new embassy while the other one stays open on the same site. So again, like you just have, there's a lots of security and things like that that have to stay in place and people have to be safe. And, but luckily we, as the architects don't have to solve those problems. Okay. <laughs> we, who, who solves those problems? Well, you know, we work together with the owner, the consultants and the contractor eventually to figure out what areas need to be you know, cordoned off while they're in construction and, and figure out flows, make the flows connect. But that's a little bit later down the line. Right now, 
you know, we're just planning the ultimate no, finished right. you know, project. I was fascinated on this National Geographic special. On episode two, they show a, a simulation from the old LaGuardia to where they're doing it in stages. And they show the first hangar going down oh, and then yeah. the next little section popping up. And they show you the whole sequence of events that took place over eight years. I'll have to watch and it's this. Sti- and it's still not done completely. And they're the challenge also of having to go over the roadway to get to the arrivals. So, yeah. Yeah. Which we don't have that problem. Yeah. But that was even an extra challenge there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's Midway like these days? I haven't been there in, in years. Are they doing anything out there? Or is it just going to be the, it, the extra airport for the it, town? It, well, it's, it's such a nice little airport because it's, it's very close and easy to get to. And, you know, they've revamped their security, brought it up to date. And, yeah, it's, it's working really well. It's, it's nice to have the two working as infrastructural hubs. I think in the future, you know, people think that it's terrible to do an airport because we shouldn't be flying. But, you know, there, there's so many things we shouldn't be doing. <laughs> but we have to look for preparing the city for the future. And and really, the, you know, in, in the future, when, when the fuel is greened and we can connect these hubs of transport, it'll be multimodal. At some point, I'm sure there'll be drones that land at O'Hare and yeah. you can transfer to maybe not even fly on a regular plane, go into other modes, trains, bikes, cars. So uh, we, we need to really organize and get these different modes into the same place so that people can take the appropriate mode for what they're doing. And I assume you're going to be using this better concrete in this project. I certainly hope so. It's far <laughs> enough out that we should be able to. Because <laughs> that's a lot of concrete. I mean, you're in these projects, you're talking... Well, probably with airport steel is more likely because of, you know, just, well, it's faster to, yeah. to assemble. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I mean, just even yeah. with, with taxiways and yeah. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, all, yeah. all the things, you yep. have to, all the roadways you have to build and mm-hmm. the little connectors and the maintenance stuff. And then the stuff you don't see that's underground and little tunnels. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I got to see our little airport, Raleigh-Durham, when we built a new terminal. I got to see the cook's uh, tour oh, of it, uh-huh. you know, and, it, and it's yeah. fascinating. It's yeah. like going to Disney. Disney has a wonderful yeah. thing called, I think, Disney Underground uh-huh. uh, at Walt Disney World. And you can go yeah. beneath yes. the, the main yeah. levels and see where all the food gets delivered yeah. and the trash comes out. Yeah. And, and then Mickey and Minnie come walking along. They're getting ready to pop up out of a trash can to entertain people. It's it, Yeah, you're bringing up something really that I'm fascinated with, which is the back of house spaces and the multi like the hybridity really of what buildings are. We think of them as one thing, but they're really yeah. many things. And I think that's even going to be happening more and more. And then, like, for, for example, working on the American Museum of Natural History, there's a lot of spaces in that building where real science is going on, which you just don't get to see, you know. Yeah. And so there, there are scientists working in labs. Uh, there are people working on fossils. They're using MRI machines to scan the collections. And so that there's constant discoveries being made that, you know, and then it has this also mission of, diffusion of knowledge and education and a bit of entertainment I would say as well all happening in one institution it's, that's cool yeah that's really cool architecture is a tough field a lot of people who are going into it you know find themselves working long hours and it's, it's very grueling but your company has a reputation of being a really nice place to work it's not as <laughs> sort of death-defying as a lot of big firms are. How, how do you do that? Uh, well, I think, I mean, first, it, with architecture, we do it, don't tell anyone, but we <laughs> love it. <laughs> so there, there's that. But I think the problem with our profession, I think, is just that there is that devotion to it, and so people tend to work longer, not because you tell them you have to, but you just do it. It, it, it starts in school, and it's kind of like these bad habits that we get into. So we have to constantly work on that. I think all of us in our profession to try to make it more healthy, more manageable. And I would say that we work very hard, just like everyone else, but we try to um, make it a fair workplace and acknowledge that there's times that people need family time, you know, both men and women. And that's a contribution to society as well. Um, 
I wouldn't put ourselves above the rest. I think we all together have to move toward better practices for the people who work there, the creative people, the, the support staff. And it's a big project to undertake. <laughs> we have to pre- maybe start in the in school and not encourage these all-nighters and things like that. It's hard to do when I myself did many plenty of all-nighters and I will still stay up yeah, very late. Right. But <laughs> I mean, the medical profession ad- addressed this a number of years ago somewhat with yeah. its residents who would not get to sleep for, you know, mm-hmm. 24 hours or more at a time Good example. because they were on duty. And you'd think that same kind of reform would come into the architectural neurosystem. Yeah. I, maybe the pandemic, if it had any positive benefits, was that people really did have more time to kind of have a life. And you need that counterbalance. I remember someone asked me a question in a lecture once. It was like, how do you manage the work-life balance? And I, my, I laughed because I was happy that I, my work and my life are the same. I mean, I don't really ever think of it like balancing it. But not everyone, you know, has to be like that. Well, it's because you don't have a job. <laughs> it's just you. It's just like right. who my you job are. Is, yeah, <laughs> I do it all the time. I love it. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, it's a good point in looking at medical profession, how they transform that. And it's a work in progress, I guess I would say. I'm sure you've got some MacArthur doctors that you could talk to and oh, get yeah. some advice over this over a yeah. beer at your next yeah. alumni gathering. Yeah. <laughs> One thing is making the workplace itself a place where you want to be. I mean, we have a place now in the Chicago office. We have enough space for doing yoga, and, and we have this outdoor garden on the roof. But if, if people, this is, this is a very new thing, you know, if people don't want to work you know, full time in there, should we have that much investment in that space or what? I mean, what do you do? I, it's really... Um, it's changed the equation, yeah. really. I think we just have to don't make any rash decisions and, and like get people back into the office and, and see how it goes and and see how people are feeling about it and try to pick the best path forward. There's yeah. so many professions now that can be done remotely, but a lot that can't, like most of the workers at the airport just can't do it from home. I mean, you can't move the luggage from your sofa. Mm-hmm. So what are, some, what are some of the ways that you can make workplaces better for people that have to be at those places? Yeah, I think you bring up a great point about, you know, airports and other places where we need to think of every place as also a workplace. That's, again, getting back to this, what is backup house? It, you know, it's actually the front of house to someone who works there, right? So, yeah. you know, so design it with that in mind. Yeah, I, I assume that Disney had a lot of effect on that kind of thinking and design because they were trying to make the distinction between, you know, who's on stage, who's performing and who's not. How do we make those environments nice and same yeah, I, I'm going to have to go visit. I've never seen the back of house, so-called back of house at Disney. Yeah, uh-huh. oh, yeah. Disney has a training program, I think it's called Disney University still, Mm -hmm. that for decades they've taught customer service and aspects Uh of of design. And like if you run a bakery, like how to get 10,000 people through your bakery in a day because they're used to doing that kind of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I was thinking of a couple of things as you're saying that. One thing that's really interesting is what do you do if you're redeveloping something in a city and it's going to take years and years to complete. Is there any way that there could be some occupation of that site temporarily with uses? And I saw a really interesting example in Paris where a group called Yes We Camp installed some housing uh, for people that need it and some also some job training and some like cafes like you were mentioning so people could start up their own cafes. And it was in place for maybe it was five years while other parts of this existing building were being renovated. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, it's not an empty site with with barricades around it for five years. It's a living site. It's also giving people a chance to get started in their careers or uh, maybe people that are coming out of um, incarceration, getting back on their feet. Like there's like a, a purpose to what the site can do in this temporary interim period that that I thought was really fascinating. Is anybody reimagining prisons, or is that too much of a political football now to even take on as an architect? You know, we talk about whether there should even be prisons. So, you know, so I'm not familiar with anyone that is actually designing them. I'm sure they they could be designed in a more humane way, but 
is it the right approach? And at this point, I think it's definitely not something I want to be involved in, but I... Well, there are other models. For instance, the model they use in Scandinavia are really like little villages where people live separately. They're removed from the population. Mm -hmm. But to a lot of Americans, it looks too cushy. But it's you know oh, definitely a, yeah. a different model of that. Right. Well, we could shift our sites from punitive response to rehabilitation response, and that would produce probably a very different kind of architecture that's getting people back and able to function in society and address the root causes of why someone might have, you know, committed a crime. Now, in your practice, when you're sitting down at the conference room and having coffee and talking about the future, um, have you guys picked a pet project in space? Because it seems like, you know, all the hipster architects are like doing something on Mars or the moon or trying yeah. to launch something into orbit. I mean, you got anything uh, going on in the space program? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm fascinated by space, but I'm really concerned most about Earth right now. And um, so all of our efforts are going toward saving Earth. <laughs> you know, this is our home. And and we know less about what's down under the ocean than we do about what's happening way up in the stars. And I'm not saying to not study stars. I'm fascinated by it, and it's, it's mind-blowing. And now with new telescopes and being able to see, like with the Webb telescope now, it's just super exciting. But as an architect, I build buildings that, you know, resist gravity and keep shelter. And, and, and so I really, my main concern, and it's putting 100% of my energies in making buildings here on Earth that will be more sustainable and will move the needle on um, environment and social inequity and living, you know, just for all of us. So, yeah, so I'm not really working on those Mars projects right now. Well, we're glad that you <laughs> we're glad that you're working on our own projects right here. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. Thanks. That was George with Chicago architect Jeannie Gang. Jiki Torres is editor of one of our favorite magazines, Atomic Ranch. She began writing at age nine, reporting on family exploits in a self-published newspaper, The Torres Times. Probably over a salary dispute, like not getting enough milk and cookies, <laughs> Jiki moved on from that Taurus beat and studied communications at Cal State Fullerton. She has more than a decade of experience focusing on all things architecture and is a sought-after speaker. She authored a few children's books featuring robots, Harley-Davidsons, and farm animals. Here's my conversation poolside at the U.S. Modernist Compound with Jiki Torres of Atomic Ranch Magazine. Jiki, I'm so happy to have you join us because I, I want to talk about this great publication that you're associated with. Of course, I'm talking about the Taurus Times. <laughs> Tell us about that publication. I was an ambitious nine-year-old, <laughs> hell-bent on telling the truth about the Taurus family. <laughs> and what exposés did you do? Oh, too many. It's just, the publication got shut down after my first edition. <laughs> you know. That's how intrepid I am, though. Yeah. And I bring that to the table now for Atomic Ranch. So was this a, a print publication? What, what uh, was it? Word 95. Word 95. <laughs> okay. And, and did you have circulation beyond your home? Or did you give it to neighbors? Were you really exposing the family to? You know, come Thanksgiving and Christmas was my biggest circulation, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, handed out paper copies. But... Was there a crossword section? Were there features? <laughs> I mean, I want to know more about this publication, really. I mean, there was probably a, a connect the dots was my was the, okay. the, the extent of my skill set for <laughs> my entertainment section. <laughs> and did you rail against parental rules at all? In this? No, the, pro the real problem was I was revealing family secrets in the Torah's Times. Oh. That wasn't supposed to be public knowledge. I didn't understand the line between... <laughs> <laughs> off the record and <laughs> on the record. So, um, but I've learned that since then. And you did? Yeah, I'm a much more savvy media content creator. And what was your next publication after that? I mean, I suppose it would be the wealth of my portfolio for my college career. Mm -hmm. I did entertainment writing. 
I did hard news for a little while. Did not like that. You know, at a TV station or a local, local, local Florida newspaper. And uh, were you like the person they sent out for the mobile home burning down? That kind of story. You know what? Actually, kind of came close. The 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 last assignment that I did that made me decide that you know what I really got to go back to features. <laughs> I got to listen to my gut. I was assigned to write an obituary. Oh. And I had to knock on doors and talk to people who didn't want to talk to me, and I didn't like that. And they, I, they didn't like the person or something? I mean, they just didn't want to talk about it. So, oh. I mean, there's a, the obituaries that run in the paper that are, like, made by the funeral home. Right. Well, but this then there's one, a more prominent. This must have been a more prominent this was, person. Yeah, this was a prominent, this was, like, an accident situation. Not to start this conversation off on a dark tone. But, you know, I, my interest in writing and my interest in magazines always came from a decorative standpoint. In high school. So you want to know who designed the casket? I, <laughs> I was asking all the wrong questions. I, no wonder it didn't work out. <laughs> That's a great casket. Where'd you get that? that what kind of wood is it? Yeah. <laughs> the hardware. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So that was short-lived. And I bounced right back into features. Okay. And, um, you know, architecture and designs, my... I mean, I was a Martha Stewart subscriber when I was in high school, and everybody was subscribing to Cosmo. Or and I was like, no, I want to talk about decor, and I want to talk about furniture, and I want to talk about textiles. And so, yeah, here I am, living the dream. So where were you before Atomic Ranch? I started my editor career at Engaged Media. Okay. And Engaged Media has always specialized in historic homes. So I've written for and edited for Victorian homes, cottages and bungalows, and I have always specialized in architecture. Mid-century is my own personal style. And after being the editor of Cottages and Bungalows, which you know specializes in art, arts and crafts, you know, homes and architecture, I got an opportunity to do a special, a one-time special, and we called it Mod Decor. I was excited because I got to really focus on the furniture and home styles that I personally, you know, really love. Big departure for the rest of our group. And then it caught the eye of Jim and Michelle Brown who had launched Atomic Ranch in 2004, 2006. Mm -hmm. yep. And at that point, it would have been 2000 and maybe 14, 15. And they were looking to retire. And they had seen that one special about mod design. They had known our publication as a specialty of historic homes and thought, well, we want to see this magazine go on, but we want to put it in the hands of somebody who understands what it's like to write about historic architecture and preservation. Yeah. They'd seen, obviously, that we had had an interest in that with that one-time publication, and they wrote us a letter and said, you know, would you be interested in acquiring this title? And I, actually, my office is right next door to the CEO, so I ran right out of my desk and into his, and I told him, we've got to do this. I had been a fan of Atomic Ranch for years before that. And this was, you know, at a time when the print media world was trying to decide, you know, websites, print, right. you know, digital. And they weren't in the market to acquire a print product, but um, I guess I made a convincing enough argument. And um, after some due diligence, we acquired the title, and it's the last print publication that we acquired for a group. And that, like I said, 2014, 15, somewhere 15. around there, I forget. Mm -hmm. Now, did you live in Durham? No, I was editorial offices where I was in Orange County, okay, California. Atomic Ranch has had a great presence here at Modernism Week for a number of years. What are some of the different things that you do that people can participate in? We host um, lectures often. We see ourselves kind of occupying a couple lanes here, one of which being that educational lane to teach homeowners who come here to look at these beautiful, inspiring homes and dark decor and try to teach them kind of the nuts and bolts side of things. What is it like to undertake this? from a budget standpoint, from a project management standpoint? What can you expect when you work with a contractor? How do you find the right team to work with you? All the way from the right realtor to help you find your historic home down to the right builders and, and designers to help you kind of bring your vision to life. And then we host um, talking tours in homes, mm -hmm. um, which is a little bit different. I mean, a lot of times you think of the Bonders and Week tours as you come in, you get this ticket and it gives you access to 10 homes in a neighborhood. You get to tour them for an hour or so. We do one house. You spend a couple hours in there with cocktails and appetizers and kind of have an opportunity to really settle into the house and appreciate those details. And then we have a talk in that house with the 
with the people associated with it. Sometimes it's the designers, sometimes it's the builder contractors. And we talk about the same conversations in the setting so you can really drive that context home when it comes to, you know, do you do the terrazzo floor or do you not? How much will it cost? Right. How does that affect the rest of your budget? What happens when you've got to rip up and do plumbing and electricity? You know, really try to do a nice balance between the nitty gritty real stuff that every mid-century homeowner who's going to take on this home will encounter at some point and then, you know, you tie it up with beautiful decor and, and style that will really reflect what you've always envisioned to be your mid-century dream home. Well, I've participated in a couple of Atomic Ranch panels, mm -hmm. and I do panels all the time, but what I really liked about yours is, is that it was as much fun for the panelists, I think, in the way that it was moderated as it was <laughs> for the audience. And such a huge number of questions that people were asking at the end, I mean, really good yeah. practical questions about how to move things forward. I mean, we like to try to demystify. I mean, I think for anybody embarking upon a project for their home, there's still so many elements at play, so many decisions to make. And then for a mid-century home, you layer on top of that, how do I make the right decision? How do I not screw up this beautiful home that I finally was able to acquire? One of the common threads that I find from all the homeowners that we talk to and the readers that we talk to, for those who come into a mid-century, you know, it's in many ways like a realization of a, you know, long-time goal. But even with that, they see themselves as these temporary stewards of these homes because we value the history and the provenance so much that when you come in, yes, you want to personalize it, you want to make it fit your lifestyle and your right. needs. But you don't want to mess up. You don't want to mess it up. You feel yeah. an obligation to this home and to your fellow modernist community, <laughs> kind of the Boy Scout, you know, leave it better yeah. than you found it. Right. And so that's what makes the decision-making process kind of a little bit more complicated or a little bit more stressful. You know, am I going to take down this wall or not? Am I going to take out this original sink or original window or not? And I always say that preservation is a range you know, I mean, you are trying to marry your personal needs with this idea of preserving as much of the authenticity of the space as possible. And then we also try to talk about, you know, when you can't, when you've made that decision set and you say this kitchen is not going to work for me, how do you change it in a way that is period sensitive, respectful, done in an artful way that when you're channeling your highest and best decision, what would Kreisel do? What would Eichler do? you know, if they were making this house today. And we explore those ideas. And it's kind of fun to <laughs> pretend to know what they would do. Yeah. Or at least, you know, talk through that. Now, what are some of the rookie mistakes that people tend to make the most frequently and then come to you and ask how to undo them? <laughs> I think, honest, and, and I can and see I see why this happens, because oftentimes people who are getting to the mid-century, they've been trying for a while. They've been looking through what's the right property. The biggest mistake I think they make is they go too fast. Oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to yes. do this, yeah, as soon as I unpack. Yes, and you're making these long-term decisions when you haven't lived in the space long enough to really truly determine what you need and what you don't need. You know, on the in the context of preservation... You know, sometimes the best way to make that preservation decision is having that context and saying, no, 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 I really do need this and this really does not work for me, so I, I, will, I will need to change it. And sometimes when you live in a space, you realize how you can work with it or how it does work for your family or how you can adapt to it. But even if you're not thinking about preservation, you know, you're making decisions on fixtures and materials, tile, color, without understanding the way the light moves through your house or the way you are going to have people over and the way you entertain, the way you need to work with your floor plan. So I think by coming in and living in the space, even if you have a ton of ideas going into it, by really you know settling into the home and understanding how you'll use it, I think you end up making decisions that will serve you for the longer term. Tell us about your house. How long have you been in your 1951 mid-century ranch? Moved in in 2017. Okay. Feels like a blink of an eye ago, especially when you throw a pandemic in the mix. Yeah. And where is it? What town <laughs> are you in? It's in Fullerton, Fullerton, okay. California. Where you went to school? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. And Fullerton has a really unique mid-century history as well. And it's nestled right by the Orange Eichlers. And then we've got our own, you know, set of homes with, you know, A. Quincy Jones floor plans. So I'm a couple blocks away from those famous neighborhoods. Um, yeah, but I moved in in 17 and have been slowly working my way through. Slowly working my way through yeah, that's the way to I your advise. Point. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, but we've had to do a lot. I mean, we came in with like zero landscaping. So we've been doing interior things like the kitchen and then exterior things like building and designing landscaping from scratch. 
Do you have people who sometimes wish the house was bigger? Because oh. I imagine a lot of these are not normal American house size now. <laughs> We're no, yeah. uh, as frequent Costco shoppers and yeah. all that, you know, it's certainly, uh, it's an adaptation in, in mid-century homes. I mean, the average mid-century home, save for many of the flashy glam ones we see here in Palm Springs, they're attract homes. Mm -hmm. um, they're attract homes in the 50s for, for middle class, uh, burgeoning middle class or young right. families, post-war families. And so you come into these and you find out the storage is not that great. You find out that the kitchens are closed off or, yeah. <laughs> you know, closets are, you know. So you really have to kind of walk the line. You do. Preserving, uh, respecting the past. Yeah. And, and therein comes those decisions where you are making decisions about a lot of things when it comes to reservation. Because there's a lot of ways these homes don't work for us right now. Yeah. Well, I've heard of people building either sheds or actual mm -hmm. ADUs in their backyard just to put their storage in. Yeah. It's like their own storage <laughs> unit. And that seems to work because their house can be just pristine for yeah. them. And then when they need a couple of rolls of toilet paper, they can go out <laughs> to this other building, like going to your own Costco. Hopefully they yeah, plan right. ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right, Tom. We don't want them to go out naked. <laughs> But you know, you for, you do you remember too that that that, that the modernist ideal was about indoor outdoor living, mm -hmm. and so you yeah. were not meant to be sequestered in your rooms all day long. You were meant to spend time in the family room, in the backyard, the patio, the garden. So right. It's a so bit of shift. It finally hits you that your space is all of it. It is not just <laughs> not just the part under the roof. Exactly. Exactly. And that's one, one of the positives I think the pandemic has taught us is to enjoy our outdoor spaces, maximize them. Don't forget about them. Yeah. You know, all of us being home a lot more. And granted, you know, it's spring 2022. Here we are at Modernism Week and we're very enthusiastic about being back out in the world again. But I don't think that that idea of appreciating our outdoor spaces will ever leave us because it's a wonderful lesson. And once you learn it, I don't think you forget that it's there to be enjoyed. So our research staff dug deep and found that you had done some really cute books on robots. <laughs> oh. Mm -hmm. And so is there going to be like a, a mid-century modern drawing book? You know, you're scooping a Am I scooping? <laughs> I'm psychic. I have been psychic all day long today. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. We, we've looked at ways to bring some fun, you know, kind of products to our audiences that are an extension of just our life, this lifestyle, the mid-century lifestyle. And I, I did think that a, like a coloring book of some sort or some type of like, you know, activity book or fun product having to do with mid-century exteriors would just be kind of a cute that idea. That would be a great seller. <laughs> you know, like maybe, maybe past Atomic Ranch covers and then you color it yourself and, yeah. oh, you know, you yeah. choose like, oh yeah, it could be fun. Make your own Boom. adventure. Make your own adventure. <laughs> Yeah, Ooh, you have good researchers. Or you could have a, uh, we have a great research staff. <laughs> or, or maybe you could do something like give them a scenario of a mid-century kitchen. How would you? And, and how would you outfit it? You yeah. know, you, what color palettes would you choose to fill it in and they'll win something, you know? Yeah. And this could be anything, whether you're two years old or <laughs> 90, just coloring it in and sending it in. What an inclusive contest. And you get a toaster. Contest. And you get <laughs> yeah. A 1956 yes, toaster. Yes, we'll bring back the free gift from the 50s. I used to go to the grocery store and get a set of Yeah, we were funny. We were just talking about that the other night. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the, the old wearing blender? Yes. Right? Yeah. The KitchenAid. The most highly collectible vintage pieces of now or freebies of yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. is true. Yeah. Isn't that something? <laughs> so Atomic Ranch does a great job, of course, branding itself. So what's the most fun piece of swag that you have now that you give to people? Well, you know what? This is another one I want to bring back. It's old swag that we sold out of, but we did cocktail glasses. Oh, yes, of course. That were really fun. And through the years, I've seen more people who are designing and making these like to order. So I think I want to get back in that business. So our next talking tour might be fully stocked with fun Atomic Ranch cocktail glasses. Yeah. You need to have a little Atomic Ranch mini store. I know, right? we do. Well, we might, we might, we have the book, we have a merchandise store with one item in it so far, <laughs> <laughs> which is our Atomic Ranch book, which just came out in the fall. And, uh -huh. But we have, you know, when we come to Modernism Week, we have merch that we do physically, like with t-shirts and totes and fun things like that. Okay. But... There's... You know, you can mail stuff too. I know. <laughs> just saying. Yeah. <laughs> We're right down the street from your home office in Durham, so we'll come pick it up. <laughs> Yeah, no postage, really. <laughs> well, 
You know, you guys, it's hard enough to learn how to be on TikTok. <laughs> now I'm going to learn how to be a logistics sh- drop shipper. <laughs> we sell books occasionally that we're involved in in some manner or the other. And I have to turn my office into a little shipping terminal yes. for a week. Yeah. But, you know, you get the hang of it after a while. You do. You do. Yeah. It's helpful if you do it all in one go. And then go. for the rest of your life, you'll get catalogs from Uline. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. How did you know, Tom? Oh, trust me. <laughs> I used to, I sold stuff on eBay 15 years ago. <laughs> they never taken me off their list. No, I get Uline catalogs to people that they make up. They make up the names to get it through the mailing system. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, so like Joan Armstrong at my address. Uh-huh. You know, there's no Joan Armstrong there. Oh, darn it. I That's mean. great. But I, she, but I needed a traffic cone. But she's head of the shipping department at my organization. <laughs> yeah. They've just made this stuff up to get it through. Well, they've clearly cornered the market because I, too, get the Uline pencils and, yep. you know, yeah. koozies. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe Uline, if you're listening, you can be our next sponsor and we'll right. talk about you more respectfully. <laughs> there oh, they're go. fine. They're there great. It's just they they really do aggressively they send do. out their very thick phone book size catalog. Yes. The last of the phone books, really. Just about. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Them and Restoration Hardware. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Well, Jakey, thanks so much for stopping by. This has been such a pleasure. Pleasure and, is all uh, mine. And, and we will be seeing each other annually, I guess, at these things. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. This was fun. That was George with Jiki Torres of Atomic Ranch. Singer Rose Millette was born in Chicago where she was exposed to music at her parents' bar, and by fourth grade, she sang in school and church. After her family relocated to Los Angeles in 1960, Rose formed an R&B singing group discovered by singing duo Sam and Dave, who offered to record a demo for her at Capitol Records. That demo led to a recording contract. Years later, she was introduced to another guy named Marvin Gaye and became a guest singer during his Motown recording sessions. Rose now lives in Moreno Valley, California, and sings professionally in various nightclubs. You can find her every Tuesday night in the Purple Room in Palm Springs, where George heard her last February, and her latest album is Building Dreams. Here's George's conversation with Rose Millette. Usually on U.S. Marnish Radio, we schedule a guest months in advance. There's lots of preparation and planning and scheduling and phone calls and emails and things like that. But today we're talking with Rose Mallette, who I just met last Tuesday in a club. Which was two days ago, right? No, a oh, week oh, ago. Oh, a week, a week ago. ago. Oh, you have lots of lead time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a club called the Purple Room, famous jazz room in yeah. Palm Springs. Yeah. And she is there every Tuesday night during the season. That is correct. She was performing, and I was just mesmerized, and she asked if there was a birthday in the crowd, and I just had a birthday, so I raised my hand, and she jotted down my name, (laughs) and she sang to me during all this. Really? So, you know, by the time that I was through with this experience, um, you know, I got got to talk to Rose, because she's got to be on the show, and she was very kind. Did you slip her your phone number? Uh, Later, later. (laughs) (laughs) I Googled her. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, her phone number was easy to find. Before we talk with Rose, I just want to say that you should go see her perform because in addition to being a great vocalist and having this beautiful band that she's obviously been playing with a Please. long time, they all know each other's <laughs> moments back there. Rose is the consummate air traffic controller <laughs> of the audience. What? I mean, the audience are like little airplanes okay. coming in and out of Palm Springs Airport. And she is directing all their activity. So if somebody's not quite paying enough attention, she will sort of help them shift to focus on the stage. And if someone's having a problem over here, she'll get the wait staff to direct their energies to where they are. Oh, and man. Like, and she'll That's read, full service. Yeah, and she'll read the mood of the room and like call up a certain vibe. She'll raise them up, she'll calm them down. It's just like being in the tower. You know, watching all the planes and ground control. So you're seeing a masterful show person as well as someone who can really sing. I never, I never even considered that being just 
as you had described. Is, is that something you've done, just it just comes naturally? I guess it just comes natural. You yeah. know, I, I must say, because I, I've never observed myself doing it. So I was totally unaware. I know that I can be a busybody, though. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. Yeah. Because, you know, because mm-hmm. people are eating and drinking, and she's still got to perform. Yeah. So, over here. Over yeah. here. <laughs> You have such a great history in music. You were around when Marvin Gaye was recording What's Going On and yes. Sexual Healing. Tell yeah. us about that. Oh. You know, um, during that time, my then live-in boyfriend knew a sound director at Motown. And so that was our introduction into Motown. So through that introduction, we met Marvin Gaye. Then my then boyfriend and Marvin started hanging out together. And it was during the time that Marvin was dating his, well, she wasn't his wife at the time, but her name was Jan. And so he was courting Jan and we all became friends. We'd go to the beach together. They came over to my house the and had, chi- had beach chicken. beach on the, what, Lake Michigan? No, no, no oh, on, on, on the West Coast here, oh. Santa Monica. Oh, at this point, that's right, Motown yes, was working out moved, of L.A. It had moved to California, okay. yes. And so they came over to my house and had chicken and dumplings. Mm-hmm. And so it was, it was really, really, really nice, like I said. And, and he, Sexual Healing was the song that he sang to Jan. Oh, to, okay. to to woo her, uh-huh. <laughs> because then she ultimately became his wife. Well, like who wouldn't if that was? Gonna <laughs> yeah, be, I'd yeah. marry Marvin Gaye. Well, he <laughs> <saved> to me. <laughs> well, she was. She apparently was resistant, and he just tried so hard to win her, and ultimately did. Do you th- and do you think sexual healing is what won her over? Or? Oh, well, sexual I mean, healing, man. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah, the there's song. Yeah, there's yeah. a lowercase or uppercase. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's a great story. Yeah, so that's how that all started. And what year was that about? Ooh, we so that had to be seventy. See, my daughter, do- yeah, it was in the seventies. My daughter was about two years old, and she was born in seventy-two. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh huh. So that's when that was. And then throughout the seventies and eighties, you were in nightclubs everywhere. Uh, yes, I, as a backup singer, actually, for Susan Anton at the, uh, MGM Grand. Okay. Uh, in, in, uh, Susan Las Anton, Vegas. the very tall Susan The very Susan tall Anton. Susan Anton. Yes. And um, I and uh, two others uh, were background singers for her. And we were the opening act for Ben Vereen. Oh, oh, nice. Yeah. So what was it called, the act? Uh, you, it, I was just a background singer. I, oh, okay. I, yeah, yeah. So, How come okay. you didn't ever become, you know... A star. I, I don't know. You know. I'm very comfortable where I am. I'm okay. 74 years old, and I'll be 75 this year. And you can't tell folks by looking at them. <laughs> no, really. So, you know, and I'm, I'm just allowing the universe to take me where it wants to take me. I'm not concerned with fame. I'm doing okay. Well, well clearly sense. from the Purple Room, you're doing really okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Really okay. The Purple Room is inside the Trinidad in Palm Springs which is a little confusing because you don't know whether you're looking for a motel or a club, (laughs) but just if you see Trinidad, you're in the right place. That is correct. And you have to make reservations generally to get in because otherwise there's no room. And it's one of these clubs like you would see on television throughout the 50s and 60s, or if you saw Ally McBeal at the end of every show, all these young, beautiful attorneys would go down to the nightclub and they would be Vonda Shepard singing some kind of ballad in this supper club bar. That's the vibe mm-hmm. that you get by going to this place. And are you aware that the Rat Pack hung out there years ago? Well, I thought so because of all the Rat Pack posters Mural. and signs yes. on the Sammy Davis when you walk in. Exactly, right? right, right. As well as Dean Martin, Elvis Presley, and of course Frank Sinatra. Yeah, it used to be a hangout joint for, that, for the Rat Pack. And, and they would come in just unannounced a lot of times and just yeah. start performing. Uh, yes. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Was there a band handy that had the charts? <laughs> Must have been something. <laughs> oh, was there some piano player at least? Before my time. Mm. <laughs> we learned the other night that Palm Springs at one time, between North Palm Springs and, uh, and where it becomes East Palm Springs, mm-hmm. below downtown, at one time there were like 40 different clubs that people could go to. So many places have closed. Now, I have been performing here in this area for 12 years. Since then, 
so many clubs have closed down. It was really, really prolific with entertainment venues, and it's kind of sad to see them go away. Well, this first song that we're going to play, which is just delightful, is called The Snake. And I'm not going to try to spoil it for our listeners first, but I want you to try to guess what she's talking about <laughs> by the time the song is over. Here's Rose with The Snake.
Rose, I have to guess that there was a man involved in the story <laughs> behind this song. Well, yes. However, let me say this. The song was written by a gentleman by the name of Oscar Brown Jr. And of course, it's his, so you wouldn't think that he's talking to a man. So it's really applicable to any situation where you're taking someone in, thinking that you're doing a kind thing for them, but all the time you knew that their personality or the character was questionable and they bite you in. I mean, it can be a it could be a sibling, <laughs> you know, who you uh-huh. know in the first, mm, should I or shouldn't I? Well, I'll go ahead and give them the a old chance. Leopard never changes their spots, <laughs> sort of thing. That's the same. Yeah. 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 So that's that's how that came about. I'm I sure. think there's some Aesop's fable about this animal that takes this um, crab or a scorpion, scorpion across oh, yes. the river. Yeah. <laughs> and the scorpion says, no, I won't bite you if you'll take me across the river. And it gets taken across. You could do a whole album of, <laughs> of songs about bad animals. Well, you know what? And he, he also wrote a song that was called Signifying Monkey, mm. which is, I mean, if you, you've got to listen to it. And it is so funny. So, yeah, Signa, he did a lot of humorous songs yeah. about animals. Those are the ones that stick in your head. You know? <laughs> yeah. When I saw you perform the other night, I couldn't help but think of a song that was featured on the TV show The West Wing mm-hmm. called The Jackal. You ever heard that Had, song? No. Well, you should look that up. Okay. Because you performing The Jackal would just, like, bring the house down. Cool. At the Purple Room. Okay. So, I just I, I for what that's that worth, I will pass that along. This second song, a little more upbeat than The Snake, is called Rock Me Baby. Tell me about that one. Well, it's a nice blues tune where I was able to enlist the musicianship of some of the best musicians. And, um, well, you, you'll see it, it has that nightclub feel at the end of the evening where everybody's feeling the juice and getting down. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Rose with Rock Me Baby.
all night long. Oh, rock me, pretty baby. Rock me all night long. Mm -hmm. oh, I want you to rock me, baby. Like my back ain't got no bone. Ooh, roll me, baby. Hey. Rock me, baby. So as you can see, folks, this is a full service musician. She can sing. She can be air traffic controller. She's got the whole package. Rose, thanks so much for joining and us. And she can send oh. you dancing out the door. Yes. <laughs> it is my extreme pleasure. And who knew, just raising your hand, just, uh, you know, acknowledging that it was your birthday that was going to turn into this within a week. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's a birthday gift for you, George. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. That was George and me having a conversation with Rose Millette at Modernism Week in Palm Springs. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. And by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. Want to go with us to Modernism Week in 2023 and stay with us at the U.S. Modernist Compound? Email me, george at usmodernist.org. Okay, Tom, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 15,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist Carrie Cesarino researched all the guests for our Modernism Week interviews. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I'll be back soon with another sitting by the pool, looking at the mountains, drinking martinis, talking architecture edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. It's a tough job, but we're going to do it. 